Welcome back to Agate Fossil Beds National Monument. Our last amazing female paleontologist today is the one and only Sunshine Santos. She is studying one of our favorite mammals here at Agate, the Monoceros. I'm looking at this dense layer of long bones and skull bones scattered in this pile on display in our visitor center. Many visitors ask, well, where is the Monoceros? Well, here it is, scattered in this pile, just like the early paleontologists found them. So tell us more, Sunshine. The title on a plain background reads, How North American Rhinos Developed by Sunshine Santos, California State Polytechnic University, Pomona. Sunshine is a female with light skin complexion, glasses, and long black hair. Then a young girl with long dark hair parted down the middle sits on a horizontal metal guardrail that sticks out from an indoor exhibit. Sunshine reads from three bullet points on the screen. Hello, my name is Sunshine Santos. I am a grad student at California State Polytechnic University, Pomona, and today I'd like to discuss how North American rhinoceros developed. So um, I would like to go into a little bit of background about myself. I was born into a Latino family with um, unconventional upbringing. Um, I essentially, what that means is basically that um, my parents were both gang related. Um, my mom's family included as well. It was actually through her brother, my uncle, in which I did learn about college. Uh, he would send me um, basically information about colleges and universities and scholarships. And he essentially was um, making a connection while also trying to show me that I had options, um, that this was not the only route I had to take. Um, and so I was a first generation college student, which came with its own set of challenges. And um, some of those challenges being that I didn't really have anyone to turn to when it came to um, asking questions about applications or um, filing for financial aid or any college related issues, actually. Um, and so it was very much a thing that I had to learn on my own. And on top of all of that, I also started to lose my vision at the age of five when I was diagnosed with an eye disease. And um, it wasn't when I turned 15 that I ended up losing my vision in that eye almost completely, um, or at least to the point where I can no longer use it. So I've never had the um, opportunity to learn how to drive or any of that. I've always had to rely on public transportation, which it has its own challenges in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, um, it's not very reliable, so I've had to figure out how to work around that. Two vertical pictures fill the screen. Left, Sunshine wears blue jean overalls and a scarf tied over her head. A rock hammer attaches to a backpack strap and notebooks rest on her lap as she sits on dark textured rocks piled up on a ridge top. Right, Sunshine holds a caliper next to a black cylindrical bone. Several small trays of these bones rest at the desk near her. So pictured here is um, me and my undergrad. Um, when I started college, I was not sure what I wanted to do. I was caught between geology and biology. And it wasn't until I took a course with um, Dr. Prothero that I learned that paleontology was actually an option for me. And so um, I did take a few more paleo related courses with him and eventually talked with him about uh, the possibility of doing research. I was then given the opportunity to do research at Librea Tar Pits. And that was really special to me because um, growing up, although my parents didn't understand college, um, my dad did try to be supportive by taking me to museums. And um, the Library of was actually the first museum we did go to. So it felt fitting that that was also the first museum I did research at. Two other women in sunshine stand indoors next to a man in a suit and tie. And beyond this, it felt really special to be included in a group of um, other women who were also trying to take the same route as me. Um, everyone has been incredibly supportive and continues to do so. And it felt extra special um, to go through kind of a similar instances with other people who um, who are just going through the same fight as me, essentially. Title, Some Rhino History. Two dark brown rhinoceros look at us in a grassland. One has one pointed horn above its nose and is less than half the size of the other who has two pointed horns in a vertical line. Then the geologic graph with illustrations of a variety of rhinos within the Eocene, Elixine, and Miocene epochs listed vertically. The rhinoceros is listed within the third group labeled Rhinocerotitae within the early Miocene. So I did want to go over some rhinoceros history with you all. So rhinoceros um, are actually extremely widespread um, amongst in the northern continents and have been for the last 40 million years. But today I specifically want to talk about rhinoceros. Seven sketches of heads from different rhino species. Two of the seven show horns. 
Text, horns are made of glued hair, no bony core, and rarely fossilize. Then, two whitish skulls fill the screen. Both have upper and lower jaws with teeth, a large frontal open space revealing a hollow cavity, and a structure that protrudes from the rest of the head and hangs over the teeth. The structure on the left is smooth, while the one on the right is textured. And I did include this picture because I know that although we all may think of rhinoceros as being horned uh, mammals, they actually mostly did not have horns. And we know this because um, although horns don't really fossilize well in the fossil record, they do um, have a specific texture on the skull where they were um, fused to the skull. And so that's kind of pictured here. Um, we have two skulls, both of which are from the um, offsite warehouse uh, of collections from the, the Natural History Museum of LA. Both of them are white rhinoceros, the left being female, the right being male. You can see that the female has a relatively um, consistent texture amongst the whole skull, including on the nasal ridge. However, the male has almost like a spongy looking texture. Um, it's really coarse and rough and looks very different from the rest of the skull. Title, family, rhinoceroditide. A sketch of a rhino skull, which is a rounded rectangular shape with a bone that sticks out diagonally from the back and a curved bone that hangs over a frontal gap in the front. Arrows point to where a strip of bones touch vertically several inches in front of the teeth. Then three photos appear on screen. First, four-legged skeleton is propped up on vertical poles indoors. Second, actual brownish-red skull of a rhino. Third, one rhino jaw turned upside down reveals six to seven singular teeth in a row on each side. And so from here, I'd like to talk about um, subhyracodon, uh, the name being a little misleading um, because it's not a hyracodon, but it did have priority due to when it was named. But it is a pretty widespread genus. Um, there are hundreds of specimens in the Natural History Museum in New York, as well as the commercial market. And here is a skeleton picture here, as well as two pictures of skulls. Um, if you look onto the right picture, you can tell that the molars actually have uh, a shape resembling the symbol pi, and this is unique amongst rhinoceros. Sunshine reads from the screen. Then two pictures appear over the text. First, sketch of a Cerotherium tridactylum skeleton from bulletin AMNH. Second, illustration of two gray rhinos in a grassland. They have a narrow long tail, short legs, and a flat tubular body that extends into a thick neck and oblong head. And so um, onward, we talk about Acerotherium tridactylum, which was later reclassified as subhyracodon tridactylum. And this is the main Whitneyan species. Uh, it has the beginnings of a horn supporting ridges on the nasal bones, um, but eventually it was reclassified again by um, Prothero in 2005 into uh, Dicerotherium. And here is an illustration um, depicting it when it was known as Acerotherium, and um, also another illustration depicting it, what it may have looked like alive. The geologic time scale of the Cenozoic from 66 million years ago to the 1950s displays horizontally. A box highlights the mid oligocene to the mid-Miocene. Three photos also display on the screen, each showing a lanky deer-like animal with very narrow body features. Kristen crouches next to one displayed skeleton where her head is taller than the animal's back. And uh, 31 million years ago, subhyracodon evolved into Dicerotherium. Um, in which this genus is known for their um, developed nasal ridges. And so we have three different species pictured on the right. The very bottom is the previously mentioned Dicerotherium tridactylum. And so um, the nasal ridges weren't very pronounced at all. They're barely beginning. Whereas the very top skull on Dicerotherium armatum, the nasal ridges are very pronounced and wide and flaring even. Um, however, last year, my research group and I named the intermediate species Dicerotherium mariate, um, and basically you can see the start of the nasal ridges becoming a little bit more pronounced. And pictured here is me holding um, the skull of Dicerotherium mariate. Eight black and white images of upper or lower rhino skull fragments labeled A through H with a ruler next to each. Each skull has a nasal bone that sticks out in a different way, from short and stubby to flat and wide. Then, a short, four-legged animal skeleton displayed upright on vertical stands. A small number three tag sticks to one of the stands. Text, first horns were in pairs at tip of snout. So we know that Dicerotherium armatum um, is where the really pronounced nasal ridges are. Um, however, before that, pretty much all paired horned rhinoceros were called Dicerotherium. And this was misleading in a way. Uh, this also included uh, Dicerotherium kukai which was later reassigned to Minoceros or in 1969. And pictured here is um, a model of Minoceros or um, which was originally from Eurasia, 
And it was actually the first rhinoceros uh, at which the horn bases um, were present in male skulls in North America. And this is actually the most common fossil at the agate bone bed. Two illustrations of rhinos with two pointed horns on either side of their nose. Left, gray rhino against white background. Its four legs start thick, then taper down to wrinkled knees and three toes on its feet. Right, brown rhino in a grassy environment with its long tail curled up to its rump. And pictured here is, uh, is two illustrations of the um, Monoceros or Garanci. Uh I just wanted to point out like, that the legs look a little more long and thin compared to what we would think of with Rhinoceros. A circular pile of scattered bones surrounded by short dirt ridges. Five or six skulls appear among mostly cylindrical bones. A small sign in the pile reads, objects are fragile, please do not touch. And this picture um, depicts the agate bone bed. Um, if you look carefully, you can actually see Monoceros skulls in the pile. Sunshine uses a caliper to measure a line of teeth on a rhino skull indoors at a table. Four long shelves full of fossils exist behind her. Then she reads a list of four bullet points on a slide titled Methods. So the goals of my project were to compare um, the growth of young Monoceros erythrancy from agate and the a different genus uh, for species, Teleoceros proterum, from Nixon's bone bed in Florida to the pattern of living rhinoceros um, African rhinoceros. And so the methods that I used, um, I measured as many unbroken juvenile limb bones as possible using metric tape. I focused on the diaphysis length as well as the shaft circumference of the limb, limb bones. And I then used uh, Excel and PAST to get a bivariate linear plot of the growth. And I compared this with um, published data from African black rhinoceros. Sunshine reads a list of two bullet points on a slide titled Isometric Growth. Then a picture appears over the text. Four images of newts lined up from newly hatched to adult. Each has slimy, smooth, reddish-brown tubular bodies that are horizontal to the ground with no section breaks between the head and the tip of the tail. It also has four tiny legs with suction cut hands and large eyes. And so basically what I was looking for was to see if there was isometric growth or allometric growth. Isometric growth would be um, indicated by a slope of one. And just to give a little bit of a visual here, uh, it would basically mean that uh, a, there was a very little proportion change. So you can see the newly hatched new at the very top left has pretty much the same proportions of the adult. It just looks like a shrunken down version of it. Sunshine reads a list of two bullet points on a slide titled Allometric Growth. The two pictures appear over the text. First, six sketches of humans lined up shoulder to shoulder from ages 0.42 years to 25.75 years. The head size appears much larger in the first human compared to that of the last, as if the head doesn't fit the size of the body. Second, a line graph compares log size of trait X to trait Y. Three straight lines start at the right angle and extend out. From bottom to top are negative allometry, isometry, then positive allometry. And I was also seeing if allometric growth was possible, um, which would basically be indicative of a slope less than one or greater than one. Um, for example, if you think of humans, uh, there is a disproportionate growth from the head towards the rest of the body. Um, this is indicated by the slope being either significantly greater than one or significantly less than one. Uh, positive allometry would be uh, grass cell growth, which is basically it grows longer, faster than it does grow thicker, and by, vice versa for negative allometry um, all being called robust growth. Sunshine reads a list of five bullet points on another slide titled allometric growth, then monoceros growth. Finally, a scatter plot with a collection of black dots clustered in the center over three diagonal lines that extend across the graph. The top and bottom lines are green and the center line is red. And so we're comparing this to um, paper uh, research data from Kilborn and Makabaki, um, where they analyzed uh, living African black rhinoceros. And their data shows that there is pretty much isometry uh, across the board, although the femur slope is significantly more gracile, so longer than it did uh, grow thicker. And my data was looking at monoceros growth and teleoceros growth. Um, so far, I have not done the teleoceros growth, but amongst the monoceros growth, it shows isometry across the board, although trending more grass out for radius. And so this plot is just an example of how um, the data looks. So along the x-axis is the natural log for the circumference, and along the y-axis is the natural log for the length. And um, inside of the green envelope is the 95% error. Sunshine reads a list of four bullet points on a slide titled Discussion, then two items on future work. So basically, um, we, to discuss the end, um, 
the limbs of the rhinoceros have all shown isometry. And this is consistent with the results of living black rhino as well as other mammals. Um, and it'd be interesting to look at how this compares with uh, Teleoceros because, uh, as noted earlier, the Minoceros have longer, more slender limbs. And Teleoceros has uh, like stumpier, uh, shorter, more limbs. So it'd be interesting to see if they also show isometry. And for future work, um, all we really need to do is add data from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, they have some more data over there for Minoceros, so I can have an increase in the data set. Um, and then I have to complete uh, analyzing the data for the Teleoceros from Nixon's bone bed in Florida. A short, chubby gray rhino with huge, pointy, outstretched ears and a nose stub looks at us. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I just want to pinch those rhino cheeks. Thank you to Sunshine, Madison, Kristen, and Daniela for sharing their expertise today. Thank you also to all of you in the audience for participating. We hope you learned something new about these cool ancient mammals. See you next year. <laughs>